Hi, welcome. How's it going? We'll wait just a few minutes and get some more people in here. And I know some of you are watching this way later on, so that's all good. Um, so yeah, today we're going to be talking about singing in tune and what that means and requires. And it's such an important topic. Hi, welcome. Oh uh, yeah, feel free again, everyone, to use the chat and ask me questions, um, particular issues you may be having. That's the whole point of this live stream. It's just to be, you know, to have a little more interaction with everybody so uh, we can address some things, you know, when you're just going through the tutorials and all of these modules and things like that, it's a little bit of something for everybody. And you may have particular strategies that you need to work on to help you with all of this. Um, so yeah, again, singing in tune is kind of one of the most essential things about singing. It's uh, sometimes neglected and can lead to some really awkward situations if you're not really sure if you're singing in tune or not. Um, so I always recommend, you know, if this is all new to you, like use a teacher, someone who can give you some feedback. That's always really helpful, of course, uh, especially if you're still struggling with this a lot. But there's certainly some little strategies that we can do to address if you're singing in tune or not and how you can sing in tune better. And there's all sorts of situations where sometimes you're working with a bunch of other singers and you may not be perfectly in tune with exactly where you feel things with the pitches, but it's much better to be in tune with everyone else. And uh, we'll talk about how we do that. So sometimes being a stickler for the right note can be the wrong thing. It's about assessing uh, the other instruments around you. Of course, if you're working from a track or piano or something like that, that's already tuned, then uh, it's more about what you can do specifically in terms of making sure that you're matching all those pitches, especially in your practice. So uh, yeah, we'll get started in just a second. How's everyone doing? What's going on? Um, I'll just say hey in the chat too so you guys can see me. Uh, but yeah, please feel free to ask some questions. This is so, so important, especially for the beginning singer. This kind of stuff can really feel like the biggest roadblock, right? Um, and can be what sort of discourages people from learning to sing. And I really like everything else with the voice, uh, learning to sing in tune is, is kind of like a muscle that you can flex and you can get better and better at it. Uh, it's not something that you're just inherently born with. So there's definitely ways to train and condition your ears uh, as well as your vocal technique to make sure that you can match your pitches appropriately. So um, let's just kind of dive right in and I'm sure some more people will show up. And for all of you listening uh, or watching this later on, hopefully this is really helpful for you as well. So the concept of singing in tune and why is it so hard? There's a lot of reasons. Um, one thing to kind of point out with, with most things with the vocal technique, things aren't what they seem and there's all sorts of perceptive um, or perceptual issues that happen uh, based on like, if you might think you're singing in tune and you may not be and there's all sorts of reasons. One, for example, is just the nature of how we hear ourselves when we sing. Uh, we use bone resonance. It's resonance from the inside, right, from our skull and from our face and all of this interior space. It's, uh, we're going to have a slightly different sound than what we hear out in the airspace. And so that can be really tricky. Uh, sometimes you may think that you're singing really nice internally to yourself, but you're not projecting out to other people and you may be singing under pitch. So again, one of the strange things is if you're really listening internally too much, and you're not using other external feedbacks uh, or um, some things with the, the feeling and sensation, then you may still be singing out of tune, even if, it think, if you think it's, it's on the pitch. Um, so there's a difference. And you know, I don't know if some of you have seen this, but like when you record yourself and you listen back and you're like, wait, that's the sound of my voice. It sounds totally different from what I'm used to. That's that effect that I'm talking about. There are some things, hi, Joshua, how's it going? Um, there are some things you can do, like, you know, classic, you'll see singers like in a corner uh, or in a, an echoey hall singing and listening for feedback. That's one way is to make sure that you're, you're hearing it outside of yourself and it's the, the echo coming back to you. Um, you can actually do this, which is kind of interesting. You, you angle your hands so that they're, your uh, sound is reflecting off of your palms and into your ears. And you may notice that the second you start hearing your voice externally, 
you start projecting in a slightly different way because all of a sudden you're more aware of what it sounds like in the airspace outside of your face. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, this is this classic sort of thing you'll see in some of these game shows, right? Someone feels like they're singing really well and it feels really good. And there's, that's totally great. You know, everyone should be singing. It's, it's such a great thing to do in pastime. Of course, when you're going to these competitive things and you haven't gotten any external feedback, you may run into that issue of embarrassing yourself and singing totally out of tune and people being like, oh, you're, you're totally out of tune. You're not matching with the melody uh, and you're making up pitches and stuff. So let's talk a little bit about what we can do to fix this kind of thing. Um, and, you know, and just to point out too, this is something for professional singers. We're always trying to pay attention to our tuning and practice this so that it's really refined in our muscle memory, um, listening back to things. This is something that every professional and beginning artist should be doing. So one thing that I think is really important to note, there's kind of like two categories that I, um, I talk about when we're, when we're dealing with intonation, right? It's a fancy term for am I singing in tune and intoning. Uh, singing right into the center of a pitch. So um, one thing is it can actually often be a physical issue and it's more of your technique that's uh, holding you back. And so we'll talk about that. And then the other thing, of course, is just knowing where the targets are and understanding a little bit about theory and having a, a, a way to apply your knowledge of theory to some practices and ways to get uh, your muscle memory up you know, in the right place. So we'll kind of talk about it from both angles. Uh, the first thing is the physical one. Uh, and this is actually very similar to some of the other live streams I've done and all the other uh, modules and lessons and such. So it's all about support. So a lot of the time people are singing under pitch. It's very, very common. And one way that you can, you can really tell is if you have a very, very breathy tone, right? That's gonna tell you that pot potentially you're not supporting enough and you might be singing under pitch. Um, so what I recommend here is if, let's say, for example, you're trying to hit this pitch and you're, uh, right? That's a very clear indicator that all the air is escaping. Uh, and you're not quite getting up to it versus, ma, ma. Right. And there's all sorts of exercises you can do to try and make sure that you get your belly uh, engaged a little more. And this is right below your belly button. Right. That's the best place to support from your lower abdominal muscles. Uh, and uh, so, for example, if you do like a little cough, like <coughs> you'll feel those muscles kick out. That's where you want to support your sound from. And there's a whole practice of SOVTs, which are uh, your semi occluded vocal tract exercises using closed spaces to help build up pressure. Uh, and so I recommend going to that. If that's something that you're doing, work on some of these strengthening exercises. Again, it sort of sounds like this, this classic sort of under pitch sound, like ma, ma. It just feels like no matter what you do, you can't get that pitch to rise. It's because you're not using the right muscles to engage, right? And you're using too much of your, your throat to ah, try to squeeze it out and raise the pitch. So instead, I recommend doing some of those hissing exercises, right? Like going, see so if your belly is popping out as you're doing that to strengthen those muscles. You can do the, the Z kind of thing or the lip trill, right? Going like, Z or and always a quick note, if you can't do lip trills, don't worry about it. It really turns off a lot of beginning singers because it can be kind of awkward to do. And for some, it takes a while to learn, just kind of like whistling. You don't have to do that in order to um, work on support or anything with the voice. So that's the first thing is we control our pitch by using pressure, right? That's kind of the main system. So when we're building pressure, we're rising in pitch, by pushing out in our belly and our back. And when we relax, we're lowering in pitch. So some people have issues with letting go of the pressure in their body and they can't get down to a pitch. Um, so that's just one example of some of these physical things. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But before I go on, I think I should recommend a couple resources because this can be such a hard thing to practice on your own, especially if you're new to this. Um, yeah, definitely using a teacher can be really helpful. But there's some other options nowadays, which is really great. Uh, if you haven't used these before, I highly recommend it. Having a visual tool can be so helpful. So 
there's this website, uh, singing carrots, as in the vegetables, singingcarrots.com. And there's a couple other you know, websites like this. But the idea here is uh, go to the website, click tools, and then click uh, vocal pitch monitor. And what you can do with this is you can um, you, you enable your microphone and there's a little piano there. You can click the piano notes and it'll sh you know play the pitch so you can hear it. And then when you sing, it's gonna draw a little line where your voice is on the piano. And so you can visually see where your voice is sitting. And this can really, really help you understand how you control pitch. Again, it might be hard if you don't know a lot about theory, that still might be overwhelming, but focus on the contour. And what I mean by this is when I add pressure, does my pitch move up? When I relax, does my pitch move down? Or maybe it's not responding. And then you have to go back to some of these exercises to see if you can actually control the pitch with your pressure. Um, so I highly recommend that uh, contour again is just like following up and down with things. Even if you're not quite fully matching it, that's still a first step. Are you aware that the pitch is going up or the pitch is going down? Play a pitch and then try to match it. Of course, um, you might need to work with a teacher to figure out where a comfortable range is. I highly recommend when you're doing this, start low somewhere where you can manage it. Um, and we'll talk about some other things too, because this can be a very complicated issue. But yeah, having that visual is kind of the biggest thing for a lot of people. Uh, and it's so cool that we have that nowadays that you can actually just literally get some direct feedback. There's another one called Ella. I think it's for iPhones only. Uh, and Ella's cool because it shows you the staff or whatever cleft that you're working with. And uh, it draws in where your voice is kind of at this level. The other one kind of comes straight down. But this one shows you where you are on sheet music, essentially. So if you're into reading lots of music, uh, that can be a great way to actually practice that and even learn where, um, where all the notes are in the lines and spaces. And just make sure that your voice is actually tracking with that can be hard to tell until you really get the right sort of feeling for it. Um, so highly recommend that. And um, let me think if there's anything else before we move on. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And, you know, if any of you know of any other ones, feel free to put them in the comments here. Uh, I'd love to make a shout out to them because it's all about finding the right resource for you a lot of the time. You know, back in the day, it's, you know, people would say, learn an instrument. And that's totally true. Like learning piano, learning guitar is going to help you a ton. But uh, that can be pretty daunting, especially if you don't have the time for it and you just want to be a singer. It's having this sort of visual feedback is key, uh, I think. So let's get back to some of these um, physical issues. There's, uh, we talked about the support thing, right? It can work on the other side, as we talked about. If there's, if you have too much pressure, uh, and you're kind of nervous. A lot of the times people will, will go sharp because they're overshooting in anticipation of things. Um, and that's usually a sign that you're just over engaged. And what I would say is let a little more air out. I always tell people put some H into the sound. It's going to help you decompress until you find the right place. If you're riding a little high, um, it's a chance to take a moment, stretch out a little bit, try to relax the nervous system. So it's sort of like two sides, right? Flat means you're under the pitch. And sharp means you're over the pitch. And so when you're flat, sometimes it's because you don't have enough pressure uh, and you're going to want to do more of those SOPT style exercises. And when you're sharp, it means you're just overshooting it. And a lot of a lot of our practice is just about calibrating, trying to get a sensation for where each note is and how much energy is required. It feels a little different from day to day. So we have to check in with it every time uh, and get some more consistency that way. And the one cool thing is if you're working with the piano and you're working with all the musical notes, they never change. So we get better and better at this the more we do it. Um, I'm going to talk about some strategies here too. So I work with a lot of students who have issues with pitch. And uh, once you get past that hurdle, it, all of these other things open up. In fact, sometimes these, uh, these students have a really good sense of technique and have a really great voice, but it's just that that math is a little off. And um, there's various reasons for why that happens. But uh, one thing that can really help is start one with like a single pitch and try to just match single pitches in a low register. And what I'd recommend is if you under or overshoot it, then try to slide yourself to the pitch. Hey, how's it going, Theodore? That's good to see you. Um, so 
the idea here is let's say this is the pitch we're trying to match um and you sing it in your ma right you might try to assess like is that lower or higher you might use the visual to see that and then right away ma see if you can slide yourself up into that pitch let's say you're a little too high ma try to slide it down so the first step is assessing am i too high or am i too low uh, so you might hit this and be like ma you realize you're just going farther and farther away so turn it around ma see if you can settle right into that pitch you could again with these um pitch monitors you can press the note on the little keyboard it'll play it and then you just see where you end up you know if you if you kick a little to the left try to kick a little to the right add a little more pressure if you kick a little bit to the right try to relax it and see if it falls right down to the spot that you need and save that feeling so the idea is sometimes missing a note can actually be really great information it can can help you learn this process instead of just trying to stop and hit it again, wherever you're at, try to slide yourself to that pitch. So that's the first thing. Um, the other thing is, so a lot of our exercises, when we do warm ups, we do this sort of like half step motion, right? We'll do an exercise and right? be like, and going up by half step, that actually, it can be kind of challenging. If you're struggling with pitches, these small changes, can be really, really hard to discern. And even on the physical side of things, it can be really hard to get your voice to kind of go to, to that exact right spot. So I recommend, uh, again, start with a single pitch and then start with wider intervals. Maybe not too wide like an octave, but start with like a fifth or a fourth or a third, something that's got a little bit of a, of a, a contrast from one note to the next. So you can feel the difference when you're like, mom, uh, one of these is more engaged, the other one is more relaxed. So you get people who are like, ma, ma, right? And they're, they're still kind of holding it. Ma, ma, I let go of the breath. And then I, um, I can fall down to the other pitch. It's sort of weird how our, our brain and our body does this. If you're thinking about the other pitch, your body's probably going to drop to it especially the more you practice doing this. If you overshoot it, again, use one of those vocal pitch monitors and try to slide yourself back up. You might be like, ma. And that's totally okay when you're first starting this out. Um, let's think about some other things. So that's one sort of typical trend that's about our support pressure. And that's why I call it sort of more of a physical issue. It's hard to control the pressure and it's like a sliding scale. So it just takes time to calibrate that and get comfortable with where different pitches sit in your range. Um, the other thing is, is a, kind of similar, but it's a habit that happens for some people and it will make them usually sing under pitch or it just makes it harder and harder to sing and it's scooping. So that's when someone, ma, ma, right? They start a little under and then they scoop up to it. Um, so you can see this is like a stepping stone, right? When you're practicing, it's okay to, to do that. But if that becomes a habit, you might consider thinking about the consonant and if you're pitching the consonant appropriately. So this is a habit that happens to some people. They're not thinking about the consonant being on a pitch. Like, mm, right? it's just like a hum and M is just a glorified hum. And so if you're, mm, mm, if you're not really pitching that, when you open up to the vowel, it's going to be really hard to get up to it. And oftentimes people don't get up to it, unless you're purposefully trying to like, yeah, kind of do a sort of scoop thing. So again, that might be you if you um, if you notice that that's happening. You're like, ma, ma. And you'll, you'll see it on the vocal pitch monitor. Um, the trick there is really make sure that you're pitching the consonant. You can start with just the M and go like, and one way I like to explain this is like, if you're doing that a lot, what it does, uh, if you're if you're under pitching the consonant, when you open up to the vowel and have to scoop up, it's kind of like jumping from ledge to ledge. It's, you know, if you don't quite make it and you have to try and pull yourself up on there, that's going to be more fatiguing in the long run. 
And so a lot of that over and over again, lots of scoopiness makes you a little seasick. And, you know, just in terms of the style, you're like, oh, all over the place all the time. But ultimately, also, it's going to make it harder and harder to sing. So that's one thing you can kind of pay attention to is are you pitching the consonants that can be pitched appropriately? So, again, it would be like, ma, 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 versus this might be a little scoopy, right? I'm not quite pitching the consonant. Like, ma. Ma, ma, ma. So catch yourself if you're doing that and you notice it, especially on one of those um, visual pitch monitors, that can be something that you can easily fix by uh, using your SOVTs and really making sure that it's pitched before you open up to the vowel. Um, so those are some of the physical things um, with support. The other concept is resonance, right? One of the other main key factors of singing. If you don't have a lot of resonance in your tone, that can sometimes also make you sound flat, usually under pitched. And it's just sort of the way our ear works. It's like a single pitch isn't just a single pitch. There's all these overtones in it. And the more we have those overtones, the, uh, the more buoyant our voice is going to be, the more uh, bright the sound is going to be. And that can really help you. So this has to do with the vowel shape a lot of the time. If you're constantly singing through a kind of mumbled, half open shape, you might be blocking some of that resonance. And that also might make you sound kind of flat or at least a little lackluster to other people. So I would say resonance or the natural singer's resonance, it's kind of like natural auto tune in a lot of ways. So I'll demonstrate what I mean. Again, just in a simple range, if I'm um, maybe not using enough resonance, it might sound like ma, ma, ma. And it might, it might start to sound like it's sort of drifting down ma, ma, versus ma, 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 ma. You hear that sort of higher ring helps to stabilize the pitch. Um, this gets more and more obvious the higher you go. So maybe if I was like ma, 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 ma. Ma, ma. So if I'm ma, ma, you see that resonance starts to kind of pull it up. So that might be the other thing that you consider. Like, are you blocking your jaw? Are you blocking some of that resonance? And having a little more height can help. The exercises I like to do for that are like um, yaw, for example. It's a nice way to sort of stretch the back and gain some resonance. So let's say again, you're like, Mama, mama, mama. Let's try. Ya, 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 ya. And you're gonna try to pull in some of that resonance. Um, so I go kind of go through those as like a checklist. They're both you know simple concepts. Mama, mama, making sure I've got enough support. And if that's still not quite sounding in tune, ma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I might try to get a little extra space and see if I can get some resonance going with that. So those are some of the physical things. Essentially, a lot of the time working on your basic vocal technique is going to help you sing in tune better. Um, but let's let's go to some other things too. I've I've had some students, and this is particularly uh, generally higher voiced singers like a soprano. Uh, who have issues with their lower pitches. And this is a, a singing sharp kind of concept. And it's usually has to do with registration. So this is probably the last like physical thing to talk about. Um, and sometimes I have it with some guys as well, actually, where you get stuck in a head voice sound and have trouble accessing chest voice. So, you know, for example, this might be where I'm working with a, a female or higher voice singer. Um, and they might have this issue of going like, and they get stuck somewhere like a whole step or a, a third away and it's because they're not switching into chest voice right like Ma. head voice can only go so far and then it'll kind of just get stuck right there so with that you know Ma. Ma. right that's switching into chest voice um with that kind of concept I usually have people do more speech-like exercises. And so that's going to be like going, 
Hey there. And just trying to get someone to just imagine you're talking or calling across a room. That's a classic one, right? There's all sorts of really silly little spoken like exercises. I don't do these often, but if this is you, then that's definitely going to help you. Um, you can also just feel some of the some of the perception of singing chest voices that vibrates a little bit here. Of course, it's sympathetic vibration. It's really all on our vocal track. But you can put a hand here to help ground yourself and make sure you're feeling vibration there. And that's it's been uh, known to help some of my students. So I'll go like, hey there, hey there. And you just imagine you're sort of calling someone across the room. The higher you go, hey there. You just try to see if you're you know calling someone even farther away. Uh, and then again, using breathiness. So that's why there's an H on that one. I really like that. So you can use that like, hey, hey there. To make sure that you're relaxing your support. If you're a little nervous, you might be holding it a little tight and then you can't drop down there. Um, of course, some ranges are like an A here. It's actually pretty low. So like a bona fide soprano. Hey there. Around this, I think that's one, two. C4 um, can be a good place to try and find that. But wherever you can comfortably start to have some chest voice, uh, I recommend trying to find that, working on that, growing your chest voice, and it's going to help a lot with um, singing sharp. And this again, this happens with some of my lower voiced um, and male singers. Uh, well, they'll be stuck in a head voice. They're trying to match something like, mother, ah, hey. So I do the same kind of thing. Um, I talk about some more speech-like style of singing. Um, another one is using like a blah. Maybe if you're thinking like too careful and like really into like, you know, had like an, more of a, a classical training where you're used to everything being super tall and, you know, overly engaged and, and such, um, you might have trouble relaxing down into chest voice. Uh, it's used more often in contemporary music. Uh, I could, I sometimes do like a blah, and that's just to get someone to let go of all of that sort of careful um, placement that they're trying to do. So I'll just be like, let it go and be like, blah, 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 blah. That can actually be really, really helpful as a trick if you feel like you're just holding on a lot uh, and trying to get comfortable. Um, oh, as an aside, with all of this, if this is still really hard matching single pitches. Um, I recommend, you know, you can still practice singing and just slide around, use sirens. You don't have to hit specific pitches at first. Just try to control the contour, as I mentioned earlier. Make sure you can have your pitch go up as you're adding pressure and relax as you're releasing your pressure. And just see if you can actually just get that to happen first. The specific notes come later. Sometimes we get really tight when we try working on our specific pitches. So give yourself some time to stretch when we're working on intonation. People get all sorts of funny little physical habits that can happen, um, including myself. We, you know, we're always trying to work these out of the system because it's, it's just for emotional reassurance. Some of them are like the like lifting the, the eyebrows and these kinds of things, and that sort of helps, but ultimately kind of just causes tension. So or some people try to like kind of like create a lot of brightness and such. Um, ultimately that's usually an overkill kind of a thing. Uh, you really just need to go back and try to find the right balance of support and resonance. And ultimately, once you have that, it's, uh, it looks more effortless. You don't have to do these kinds of things with your face to try and get that pitch up or whatever you, you may think on that. Um, so yeah, that's sort of the main concept right here. So usually people are actually out of pitch because of a physical technique issue. And, you know, they're not singing the correct pitch because of support, because they're having trouble with their registration. They're trying to use the wrong register in the wrong place. Or, you know, again, like you, the other side of it is like, let's say you're in chest voice all the time and you can't switch into head voice. You're often going to sing flat when you're trying to do like, you know, maybe you're doing like a na -nu or something and going up to a head voice. And if you're not used to doing that and you can't belt up that high, if you're not going into head voice, you're na na, right? It's often gonna go under pitch. So, na na, uh, that's kind of one of the big things about registration. You know, singing in head voice is easier in that range once you learn how to access your head voice. So, uh, it's better to probably try that first than trying to just belt up there. Keep it light. Uh, that way, you're not gonna develop too many bad habits. So, those are some physical things. 
Um, there's also the scooping thing I had mentioned and resonance. Now, let's talk about some other stuff, right? This is the, the other side, which is understanding theory and ear training, which usually I start mentioning this to people and everyone leaves the room, right? No, uh, it's usually, you know, it's it's kind of feels like a, a daunting task, right? There's You can go so deep into music theory and um, into like the acoustics and the phenomenons there and such. And it's all really, really cool stuff. I, I recommend that, but ultimately as a singer, we need to find practical ways to train our ear. And so we're gonna go over some of those concepts. So the main thing is like a lot of music is very re repetitive, actually. We use a lot of similar patterns. Um, for some of you, this might be an eye roll, but like stick with the major scale, stick with something basic first uh, and try to memorize that shape. Now, a lot of people like the classic sort of concept is solfege, right? Like do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Um, that's an old school method and it's helpful, but it takes some time actually to learn that system. And it can be very specific. There's, you know, there's all these chromatic steps and changes and syllables to help kind of trend you to the right pitch. That's why people did that solfege stuff. Like uh, me is a very bright, you know, the third supposed to be very bright. So they do an E to give it some bright resonance. Um, that's where that concept comes from. Now, I find that actually for a lot of singers that kind of slows them down. I recommend like if you're sticking in a basic key and you're learning simple songs, struggling with pitch or whatever, uh, start with numbers. Numbers are a great way to keep track of your scale degrees. And there's great ways that you can practice with all of this. So for example, I'm gonna stick to C major here. Uh, I recommend if you're a lower voice singer from C3 to C4, it's a good place to work in. Um, if that's too high, you can try A major little lower and for my um, higher voice singers probably want gonna want to try a major as well you could do C major but you're gonna be switching into head voice and I, I don't recommend belting up there right away it might be kind of a lot stay light with this as we're doing target practice um, so we give each scale degree a number one two three four five six seven eight eight seven six five four three two one that way we can keep track of them and their relationships knowing where one is is kind of key to everything that's kind of our our compass and it helps us figure out the relationships to all the other notes um so what i recommend are a couple of things and you know if, if you've done some of these lessons before you'll you'll definitely recognize this but we are trying to get a sense of how these numbers are all related to each other in order. And so I'll do some things like on a rhythm like this, going one, one, two, one, one, two, three, two, one, one, two, three, four, three, two, one, one, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one, et cetera, et cetera. You can go all the way up to eight. You can come all the way back. And again, the reason for this is to have a sense of the notes and their relationship. So you're going up one, coming back, going up another, and coming back. And that way you're getting a sense of how they're all connected to one, right? So we start with one, one, two, one, one, two, three, two, one. Because the problem is you start drifting away and you lose where one is, you've fallen into another key and you're probably singing out of tune. So that's that concept. Now, kind of what's hardest, I think, about um, pitch matching in general and this whole game when the notes are next to each other, you can you can follow them. That's why we have this sort of exercise. But when you start taking out pitches and you have to jump around, that's when you're more likely to lose your place. So the exercise with this one, that's kind of a classic one that if you're if you've ever taken singing things or been in choir, you've probably done something like this at some point. Practice taking out a number or two. If you're really good at it, you can take out two or three. Um, and so it'd be like this. Let's say I'm going to take out like three, for example. I go like one, one, two, one, one, two, two, one, one, two, four. You see, I left a hole for three, right? One, two, three, four, one, one, two, one, one, two, two, one, one, two, four, two, one, one, two, four, five, four, two, one. That way I'm keeping track of three, 
but I'm not singing it. And this is one of the most important skills in singing is and in like any musical instrument, but anything that where you have to really pitch something um, and you don't have clear frets or keys, you're gonna have to audiate it. It's a fancy term for your mind's ear, a sense of yourself singing that pitch without actually singing it and hearing it in your head. And that's sort of a skill that you can develop over time by doing an exercise like this you hear the three in your ear. Uh, and that way you're able to keep track of the space uh, and appropriately go to four and not uh, miss that. So that's kind of the game there. Uh, and it can get really, really pretty hard as you keep going. The other sort of concept is the bungee scale. This is uh, just like the other exercise, except you don't go through all the other, you don't go through the numbers as you come back. I'll demonstrate. So like going like, one, two, one, one, three, one, one, four, one. So we're always coming back to one, right? That's the main principle. It's our true north. It's our compass. And we're jumping to one higher note and coming back. That might be a little harder, as you can see. Um, sort of having the notes in between can, can really help you. This is where you're at. Again, if you're having physical issues with trying to get pitched, go back to all of those other concepts before you even start doing this stuff. It'll be too frustrating. Um, if you don't have a map, don't for, you know, where things are in the edges, don't try to put in all those little small highways yet. Try to get a sense of where your range is and the registers first, and then we come to these kinds of exercises. So that can be really helpful, right? This bungee concept um, going note by note and then taking out notes and keeping track of it in your ear. When you get really good at it, you can try this. So I have a key like one, seven, two, three, six, five. You know, and I can sort of test myself and make sure that I'm going to those notes. Of course, I play piano so I can check right after it but you can use some of these visual cues like uh, singing carrots as well. So again, I'll be like, I'll sit in a key, this is C, and I'll be like, one, three, five, four, three, seven, one, two, three. And eventually you realize there's only so many ways you can jump from one note to the next. And you start to get used to all of those motions. Like I did this one a lot because I think it's kind of hard. Seven, two, jumping from that really, really high note to the really low note, close to um, close to one and eight on either side, but not quite there. It can be a, can be a hard thing to make that big jump. Um, so that's that game. The other thing I think it's important to note is, uh, you know, a lot of our exercises, we do one, three, five, eight, five, three, one. We're sitting through the main chord tones and uh, it's because those are a little easier to grasp. They're easier to hear. They're part of the, the harmonic series and the overtones. So we, we kind of are able to follow those better. What's really hard sometimes and often when people are having pitch problems, but you know, they're normally good at matching most pitches and following along by ear, may not know much about theory or reading skills. They're often struggling with the two, the four, the six, sometimes the seven, right? It's all the notes in between our basic chord tones, like one, three, five, and eight. Those are our main chord tones. Uh, so that's something you might want to practice are those in-between notes. And there's a way to do that as well. So I'll sit here and be like, one, three, five, three, one. And then I might try to find the notes around these chord tones. So like five, six, five, four, five, la, da, 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 da. So all the notes that kind of border that five. And then I've got three, four, three, two, three. That's a really good one to practice, right? There's lots of suspensions that go like four, three, two, three. You get used to that. And then you start hearing that and you know exactly what scale of three that is. Um, and same thing with one, right? One, two, one, seven, one. You just get used to the things in those zones. That way, if you're having trouble hearing two, four, six, or seven, uh, you can use the, the notes that you're used to finding, like a five, and then try to audiate that and then move from there. And you're more likely to hit the right pitch, actually. So 
a lot of this is a strange guesstimating game that we do. And our bodies, you know, when we do this sort of practice a lot, our body tends to fall into the right zone a lot of the time. So it's kind of just when we uh, lose track, what do we do, right? There's nothing worse than like, oh, I'm, a, I'm singing the wrong notes and now I don't know where I am. How do I orient myself? It's this kind of stuff and these sort of practices that help you with that. Uh, and it's, it's so that it becomes part of your muscle memory. Uh, the other thing is like, there's science to what happens with your ear um, and the cochlea and everything. When you're training these things, it does actually help sort of um, the, the fibers in there start to clump together and you get a better sense of clear pitch differences. Uh, and that actually uh, is something that happens over time. So if you're really struggling with this, I like I recommend just like anything else, consistent practice. And those notes are actually going to start to feel and sound clearer to you. So again, what happens is like if you have, don't have a trained ear, all the notes kind of wash together. Uh, it's sort of part of the physics of it too. The, we hear all the overtones for all the other pitches in a single pitch. It's really a, a crazy concept. I won't go too deep into it, but we all intuitively have a sense of um, harmony and intuitive sense of, of musical language, actually. That's why it's so universal in this way. Uh, but some of those, the, the overtones that are closer are the, like the, the five and the four and the three, these kind of basic intervals. And then these small half steps are farther and farther away in our ear. Sometimes we get lost in those. And I call it sort of like um, an auditory hallucination. We get lost in the overtones and we have trouble feeling or hearing the bass pitch. A lot of that just comes with time and doing these kinds of exercises. You actually will start to be able to clearly hear the correct tones as your ear and your body rewires to do this appropriately. So have patience with it. It's something that magically happens as we keep working on these things and use all of these tools, right? Like the visual tool, uh, matching with the piano, matching with a teacher and their voice. Sometimes if you're struggling with all of this stuff, again, come to a teacher. We can really help guide you um, and matching with a similar type of voice can sometimes be even better, uh, depends, right? Uh, I'm not saying you have to, as a, a male singer or lower voice singer, have to sing with a male teacher, but sometimes that can be really helpful if you're having trouble locking into pitches. Um, so th those are some of those concepts. Um, do, does anybody have any questions? I know where I'm kind of in, just sort of talking into a vacuum a little bit, as these YouTube lives can feel sometimes. Um, is that all making sense to people? Do you have any other uh, exercises or tricks that you guys have found or how has this been been going for matching pitches all of you uh, so okay i'll give you guys time to, to think about things and respond if you want no pressure uh but you know I, i'd also recommend like i can't this is, a, this is tricky you know copyright things i can't sing the songs i don't want to uh get sort of flagged for that but there are some simple songs that are really great for matching pitch. I would do things that have like one note per word or a few notes per word and uh, something that's slow and stays in the smaller range. Like uh, I do like Can't Help Falling in Love or Ain't No Sunshine. Some of these things where you, uh, it's a very repetitive melody and you can get used to jumping a specific interval uh, Again, I wish I could just sing it for you because I'll show you, but uh, I don't want to get flagged. But anyways, come to a lesson and we can go over some of these workshopable songs that I'm talking about that help you sort of grasp musical tones and have some sort of anchor, like one song where you can get a sense of these intervals. It's going to help you with the next one because music is all relative and all these patterns repeat. So again, stick with like a major scale, stick with a simple song with basic intervals that doesn't jump around like super wide, but also isn't just like in these fine sort of half step things like a really intense sort of jazz piece. You might wanna, wanna wait on that until you've got a better sense of these larger intervals. Um, that's sort of that side of things. And I think I, I mentioned this last time, or I mean, I mentioned this earlier that, so let's say you've been working on pitch practice and I've seen this before. Uh, and you're really, really getting bit good at it. And you've got a good muscle memory for a piece you're working on. Like it's really locked in. You've got the feeling for it. And you start to sing with some other live instrumentalists 
perhaps other singers is kind of a really good example, like quartet singing is some of the hardest stuff for intonation because you've got these other variables. You've got other people singing. They might sing the wrong note. Their tone and their timbre might be a little different and it might make it sort of clash with yours. You might get a little confused as to what pitch they're singing. This happens sometimes when people are used to singing along to a piano and then all of a sudden they have a guitarist that they're playing with. The, the timbre of the instrument's different and it sort of confuses you as to what pitch you're on. Or the first time you know I, was, I ever sang with an orchestra, it's like, whoa, that can be really overwhelming. It's hard to grasp where your pitch is when you've got all these things happening with all these different instruments. Um, you, you know, once you do all this practice and you really train those pitches, you have to start turning on your peripheral ears and you have to just sometimes sacrifice a little bit of that pitch accuracy to be in tune with your other instrumentalists. And that, this is a little more of an advanced concept. So for my advanced um, singers and musicians, you know, that's really the key a lot of the time. You know, if you're just like a stickler for the right answer, like I'm so right on my pitch and everyone else is wrong, and you're sticking out and they're not, then you're the wrong one because you're not blending with them. There's plenty of beautiful tracks, um, musicians, so many musicians where they're not singing exactly on the pitch, but they're perhaps as a trio or quartet, they're in perfect harmony with each other. That's more important. Um, and so that's the idea of the relationships with the pitches. And there's some exercises for this too. This is about training chord tones um, as opposed to like our scale degrees with the numbers, that could be a, something that confuses people, right? If I'm one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that's my scale for C major. Um, the first chord, one, three, five, three, one, uses those numbers, but the next chord, you know, two, four, six, four, two, that's gonna be really hard to keep track of all those numbers. So when I'm practicing chord tones, I work on just keeping each one, one, three, and five for those chords. Like one, three, five, three, one. One, three, five, three, one. Whatever chord you're sitting on. Um, now, the concept here is if you really want to sing in tune with people, the best thing is to know what scale degree you're singing on in the chord with everyone else. So let's say I'm singing the third in my harmony a lot. Three. I'm trying to make sure that that matches with these other ones. And there's a feeling that comes with that. It comes with practice. Um, but I'm, I do this one where I practice like slotting in a chord tone when the other ones are missing. So like, for example, this, I'll play the fifth. Three or la. Make sure that I've got that. And then I might hit a random other fifth. Like, la. La. And again, right, you might hit the wrong note and you might be like, La. slide into it and help correct yourself. I'm not saying this as don't do this as a performance tactic, right? This is just how we teach ourselves to find the right place. Because if you do that all the time, you become one of those scoopy singers, right? Uh, and then you have no sort of definition to your voice and that can be a trick. But you can still use this as a tool um, and so, I'll play those notes around, or you can have um, a teacher sort of guide you through that. Of course, it does help if you can play an instrument when you get to some more advanced sort of tactics like that. Um, yeah, so that's that's something that I definitely recommend. Uh, vocal recording, yeah. Yeah, 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 uh-huh. So yeah, this can be, oh, actually, you know, you and you reminded me something. Uh, uh, let's talk about this for a second, because I, I didn't really mention um, like recording stuff or using microphones, right? Like if you're a singer on a stage, um, first of all, and we'll get to this in a second. If you're a singer on a stage, definitely ask for monitors, right? If you can't hear yourself in the sound and you've got like a microphone and some other electronic instruments, get the sound tech to help you hear yourself in the monitor more, right? Cause that's gonna help you sing in tune better. If you don't have external feedback, you're just going completely on your muscle memory and that can be an issue too. So we use all of these skills. Um, so for vocal recording and pitch accuracy. Now, when you use your headphones, do you put both, here actually I can demonstrate this. Do you put both of them on like that? Or do you do this, this tactic? So you'll notice actually a lot of session musicians will have one ear on and one ear off. And this is precisely for this reason. I'm so glad you brought this up. Um, if you're, so for example, if you're singing with other singers, like 
live in the room, um, that's that's going to uh, mean that you want to try and tune to them with your peripheral ears and not exactly what you hear in the recording. Um, so that having your, your ear, one ear out, is actually going to really help you bridge the gap because there's so much to be said about singing into a space and the acoustics of that space. And a really great singer is someone who sings the room and sings the people around them, right? I don't know if uh, for other musicians or singers who've sung live a lot, you'll notice that singing in the space without people feels totally different. And yeah, there's the nerves and stuff, but when the people show up, it changes the acoustics of the room even a little bit. Um, my point here is that there's so much that we do to adjust our sound based on the feedback that we get from the vibrations in the room. Um, this can be hard if you're in like an isolation booth that can make it really, really challenging. Um, so what I recommend though, is if you're in a, ni a nice studio that isn't like that, uh, you, you can have one ear on and one ear off. That sort of helps. Um, now, let's see, I just wanna, um, when I use it, I hear myself hitting the right pitches during recording or when I play it back, some of the notes are flat. Yeah, yeah, and so this is what I was talking about, this perception thing. It can be really challenging. Um, there are so many factors to how something sounds. And even uh, certain chords, when we when we sing them, the, you'll notice this with some of the vocal pitch monitors, that it sounds in tune and it, when it changes a little bit. Like if you're singing uh, with a certain sort of chord quality, uh, like a minor shape, it might sound better, like a little voice, like a little lower. Whereas like, if you're doing like a major seventh and you, you're trying to hit that note, it has to kind of feel like it's rising and feel a little bit lighter for it to really be in tune. Uh, so sometimes there's some subtleties to that. And it's just part of the, the challenge of recording because you might think you hit something perfectly, but it's just not quite in the right place. It's in the right range but it needs to be a little brighter or a little darker. And you can use vowel modification. You can adjust support and resonance and all of these things to try and find that sweet spot. Uh, but there's a little bit of gap of, of a gap. You know, you might, uh, this, this happens to everybody as they're, go, you know, in a recording process. Um, there's one other trick though, that's kind of interesting. And some people, you know, it's a little controversial in some ways, but if you're trying to, um, trying to get like a really nice recorded sound and you're working on um, session stuff and recording, it can be a great way actually to, to train your ear and, and work some of these things. Um, you can put yourself on like uh, an auto tune or something where it uh, modifies your pitch. Like, you know, even like on GarageBand or something like that, you can put sort of like a 30, 40%, 50%. You can play around with this. And um, if you don't have like a super fancy setup, there'll be a little bit of a delay as you're singing and you'll hear it sort of come back to you and you'll hear your voice uh, sort of modified, right? The places where you tend to fall out of pitch. Of course, it, it'll do some weird things with like vibrato and some things and make it sound uh, very unnatural. So I, I highly don't recommend people use excessive autotune on their voice unless it's a style thing and then, then that's totally cool. But if you're using it to hide something, we can always tell. It sounds sort of like there's a particular sound. It sounds kind of shimmery and a little robotic. And it takes away your organic human sounds, which I think is where a lot of the emotion and the chills that we get come from those imperfections. But you can use this as a really good um, sort of practice is I'll, I'll put myself on 100% auto-tune and I'll note the differences like, oh, when I sing that, it sounds like this when it's perfectly tuned. I may not like that sound again because of this sort of concept of uh, there being a range to intonation um, is getting a little advanced. But you can actually practice that, listen to your auto-tuned voice, save some of that feeling, and then take it off. Don't forget to take it off. And then practice singing without it and see if it just sort of changes the feeling a little bit. You might notice that you have a slightly lighter sound or more space that you need or a little more support. And that'll help kind of guide you to the right feeling. Uh, I don't know if that that's particularly helpful for you but oh hi carl how's it going <laughs> welcome we're just about finishing up here but uh good to see you so yeah that's that's kind of what i'd recommend there that can be sort of a fun fun game and then sometimes also um it has to do if in particular in recording it has to do with 
um, the kind of filter that you're using or the kind of mic. Certain mics will have uh, will bump certain overtones, like the lower overtones or the higher overtones. You can be a great singer singing with the wrong mic or the wrong filter for a particular song, and it's just going to sound kind of off or kind of flat. Um, and it goes again to show you how complex this whole process can be when you're really trying to refine something. And so the right or wrong filter can make you sing a different way, um, you know, sometimes too soft, too loud, uh, and bump, it's bumping certain overtones in your voice to make it sound kind of out of whack. Uh, and that can be part of the reason too. So I've definitely had some times where I'm like doing a recording and I'm like, this is just like not working. I just doesn't, it sounds like off, right? And then I, I'm like, I need to mess around with the filters and I find the right filter and all of a sudden it's just like, I'm able to sing just the right way into the mic. So these are all, they're all kind of like prisms, right? They sort of take your sound and re-represent it through an algorithm. And uh, so it's gonna come out a little differently from how you're used to singing. If you're a recording artist, you'll kind of notice that. Um, yeah, good, good. Um, how do you remain on pitch? Yeah, it is a little bit just practice and muscle memory, um, certainly. I'd recommend, you know, with some of this stuff, it might seem really daunting, like, oh, I have to know every single scale degree for every song that I'm playing. Um, and yeah, that's, that's helpful actually, ultimately. But I kind of like typically try to make sure that I know key spots and what those numbers are. And so this is kind of how you can apply what we were just talking about, with all the scale degree things um, to actual songs and, and really uh, in an easy sort of way. So it doesn't feel like you have to do hours and hours of homework. Uh, what's the starting tone, right? You know, there's a lot of songs where it starts with the one, but not every song, right? Some songs start on like a two or a six or a five. And knowing that's going to be really, really helpful, making, you know, just make sure you get out, uh, get out on the right, right pitch when you start, because that's sometimes, you know, the nerves people, once you start down the wrong track, and then you get flustered, you start freaking out, you, you can't really um, keep track of everything and think calmly. So I really make sure that I have a good sense of muscle memory for the starting pitch, but I also know what scale degree it is. And when I'm having issues chronically with a certain song for a certain pitch, I figure out what that scale degree is there. And that often helps me fix that issue too. Transitions, right? These are big, uh, big points in the song when like you're going up to a, a high note in a chorus or there's a big interlude and you have to come back in, you're gonna wanna try to figure out the scale degrees for that. And yeah, it is a little bit muscle memory and practice. And um, that's part of the, the scary and fun thing with singing in general is, you know, the, the sensations vary a little bit and you have to use all of these skills to try and keep yourself in the right zone. And just know that if you hit a wrong pitch, uh, it's not the end of the world. It's the trick of coming back on it and finding, um, finding your melody again. That's why I talked about some of these concepts of like, you hit a wrong note, how do you find your way to that pitch by knowing, oh, that was too high or that was too low. Um, and, and, you know, so that's sort of intuition can really help you. Uh, if you're not sure which, which side of the note you're on, then that's going to be really disorienting as well. So yeah, some of it's practice, um, getting comfortable with your voice. The more you sing, the more you get a sense of where your voice sits and the feelings um, that are there uh, for your, your lower notes, your higher pitches. Uh, of course, that still varies a little bit. That's why I try to do this daily. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the game and you can, you know, your ear can be in shape. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, it's, that's why I consider this like a, you need to have a consistent practice. So you're, you're keeping your ear in shape. Um, just like a muscle, like anything else. If I don't work on my ear training stuff, I get loose with this and I, my intonation isn't as perfect. So I really recommend a consistent practice. Um, just like anything else, you don't work on your vocal technique and it's harder to control your voice as well, right? And you're gonna have, and it's gonna feel a little rusty and out of shape, just like anything else. So yeah, any other questions before we before we wrap up? Um, just sort of as like a sum total. Ah, advice for singing acapella. That can be really challenging, right? Um, sometimes it's, <laughs> Carl, <laughs> uh, you can if you sing really, really at the right exact pitch and you're like a 
operatic singer and you can sometimes break glass <laughs> but mainly people's eardrums first so i don't recommend that um yeah but you know actually this is a kind of a funny thing sometimes i will practice back in the day with a you know a real piano and the back open and you can practice singing pitches and trying to see if you can get those strings to vibrate if you're really singing in tune with stuff you'll feel it shake and vibrate and rattle with you so carl's on to something there <laughs> um acapella singing is some of the hardest stuff that we can do as singers uh in fact that's why i recommend for a lot of singers to be able to play a few chords hello and good morning i'm sorry we're just finishing up here but um if you're uh, you know, click comping some chords or playing a little bit of guitar or using a karaoke track is so important if you're a beginning singer. Uh, acapella stuff can be really, really, really dangerous uh, in terms of drifting with pitch. And so that's why a lot of times these game shows, oh, sorry. Um, with these uh, game shows where you have to um, learn a piece and sing an acapella, that can be some of the hardest stuff to do. And that's why it's almost like a little mean because it it sort of puts people into a, a difficult position as potentially someone who doesn't have a lot of training or a, a consistent practice with this. So uh, some of the things with acapella stuff is learning what it feels like to lock into certain intervals with other singers. So I do this with my students sometimes where they'll sing a note and I'll sing the fifth either above or below depending on where their voice is. And we get the sensation of what that fifthness feels like. When you sing an interval, it's a joint sound all of a sudden your voice kind of blends into the other voice and that can be disorienting a lot of times people when they sing harmonies they tend to drop to the other pitch or they tend to follow it a lot because we're used to following um and so that uh that can really throw people off but once you get the sensation of what a fifth feels like or a third feels like uh that's gonna help you lock into pitches a lot more uh also i recommend if you're singing a cappella and you're like uh, doing without a piano to pitch things, practice finding your note with a pitch pipe. So you blow the pitch, whatever the, the root of the, the, um, the key is or where, you know, wherever you're starting with your song and then practice finding it. Like maybe you're blowing like you're blowing that, but you have to start on the fifth. So you blow it and then try to match that pitch, right? So knowing where your starting note is kind of key. Most people fall out of tune almost immediately, pick a random note. Um, Practicing vibrato puts me off. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I'll just stay for just a second longer and we'll talk about this. Um, vibrato is a really interesting thing, right? Because you're kind of oscillating around a pitch. So actually a lot of people, sometimes they can use vibrato to mask the fact that they're not entirely sure where the pitch is. So if you're doing that, I recommend practice it straight tone because you have to hit exactly where that pitch is uh, and then put in the vibrato because your straight tone is going to be like your center line around the pitch. And then your vibrato is going to go around that. Um, we have some courses about vibrato coming out at some point uh, soon. Or, well, I don't know when, but at some point, uh, Carl could tell you more about that. But uh, the idea here is, um, yeah, yeah. I would practice with straight tone. And, and the idea here too, is like, sometimes if you, if your vibrato is too wide, there's like sort of a range. Eventually vibrato, like you're, you're making it really unclear where the pitch is. So if I'm like, la, you can tell that's the pitch, but I'm uh, around it. But if I'm uh, that's kind of somewhere between some other pitches and that's not clear intonation, right? That At that point, it's kind of muddy. So a wobble or too wide of a vibrato, especially in a lower range, can uh, sometimes mask the fact that you're really just not sure where the pitch is and don't have that feeling so that's what i'd recommend yeah sing it straight tone um and then yeah and then add in some vibrato stuff so yeah anything else i think i'm about to wrap it up <laughs> like a fry. you might hurt yourself if you try to do that i don't think it's even physically possible um but that would just be like trying to flip back and forth between an octave and see what happens. Now, usually a vibrato is somewhere between like a half step uh, of pitch change <laughs> sounding. Yes, yes, it is a typically an issue with uh, older singers with core issues sometimes. So when you have a wobble, it just means you need to uh, do some Pilates, do some stuff to work on your core strength and some SOVT style things, right? With the pressure 
work and that's going to help you actually even out your vibrato it happens to a lot of people actually and a lot of even famous uh singers they're used to singing a certain way and they lose that sort of core strength underneath it but yeah as i was going to say a vibrato usually uh is like like a half step or so and then anytime it gets past like a somewhere between a whole step or a minor third it starts to uh, actually really we can't tell them put pitch it's on and that can be uh, a big problem so yeah i'm glad you brought that up yeah vibrato is really interesting with pitch um there's this thing as we go higher that our vibrato can get wider without us affecting the that sort of sensation of being on pitch or not so that is sort of an interesting phenomenon like um our higher notes do they, the vibrato does and can get a little bit <laughs> uh a little bit wider uh, but within reason so that's actually something that if you looked at one of those things like singing carrots, um, you can actually, you'll see if your vibrato is starting to fluctuate too much beyond like a single, in this case, it's like a key on a keyboard. Uh, and that might be a sign that you have a wobble and need uh, maybe a teacher or somebody to help guide you to a more even vibrato. So, all right, I think that's about all we have time for for today. I'm so glad you guys asked all these questions. That's really exciting to see. Um, and that's when I think I can be most helpful for people and kind of the benefit of these YouTube live sessions. Thank you, Carl. Yeah. All right. Um, I will catch you guys next week. I can sing well. And I also <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. Okay. Well, yeah. Um, anyways, yeah, again, if, if you guys, any of you have confusion with any of this, come meet with me one-on-one -on -one or uh, meet with Camille or you know, check out any of our other uh, videos on intonation and singing in tune and, uh, or, and or vibrato or what, any of these other concepts and you know, glad to help you out with it. So I think next week we're doing smooth tone, which is gonna be really fun. Uh, a lot about resonance and you know, moving from one vowel to the next. So I will catch you guys there. All right, take care everybody.